All right, welcome to the fifth annual Robert J. Morris Chemistry Symposium. I'm Robert Samuelson. I'm the chairperson of the Department of Chemistry, and it's my honor to uh, preside over this symposium. Uh, just a little background here. So, uh, Robert uh, Joseph Morris, as many of you know simply as Bob, completed his Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry at Ball State in 1986. He then went on uh, to complete his Ph.D. Uh, in, under the direction of uh, Dr. Greg uh, Gerolami uh, at the, in inorganic chemistry at the University of Illinois. And then I need to talk to Sandy. We need to get a picture. So he went on to do an NIH uh, postdoctoral fellowship at UC Berkeley. So I got my Berkeley mug since that's where, where I was here. That's the best yeah, I can get for now. So. Uh, for future times, <laughs> do that. And that was with Dr. Robert Bergman. Anybody knows Bob Bergman? And then he returned to Ball State as an assistant professor in 1991. So, and by 1993, he had already obtained chemistry research funding for his laboratory from the Indiana Academy of Science uh, Research Corporation, as well as the American Chemical Society uh, (PRF). And then he was fully promoted in 99 and became the chairperson of the Department of Chemistry in 2002. And then later he accepted a position as an associate provost for research and the dean of the graduate school at Ball State, which then became an associate vice president position during his time. In uh, 2016, Bob served as the acting provost and the executive uh, vice president for ac academic affairs at Ball State. So as many of you know, uh, Bob passed away on uh, Monday, November 28, 2016 at Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis. So I'd like to, I'd like to just thank uh, the Department of Chemistry and uh, many friends, family, and colleagues who have supported the Robert J. Morris Chemistry Symposium Fund over the years as a tribute to Bob. That this legacy of the symposium now includes a number of key uh, keynote speakers over the past five years, as well as uh, about 10 uh, all state students that have given talks. So here's just a, a few of the keynote speakers that we had over the years. As you know, one year we didn't have one, and another year we did a virtual one. There was a pandemic going on. And then we've slowly now transitioned back to uh, uh, the symposium. So, and with that, to start the symposium today, uh, Jim Pyle, uh, an emeritus faculty here, who actually helped start this uh, uh, symposium fund, has kindly asked uh, for some time so he could say a few words about Bob. So, Jim, I'll leave it to you. Since I'm out of practice, I might be need, need to use the mic. Hello. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? For those of you who don't know me, my career has three phases in it. First is an organic chemist, then as an environmental chemist, and then as a research administrator. And it was in that role as a research administrator that I found myself at Ball State in 1983. And my God, that's 40 years. <laughs> so it's been a wonderful 40 years. Um, and uh, through that time, I knew Bob in many different roles. I just wanted to share some things with you to describe his persona. I first uh, came upon him as a, not as a, not a teaching in a lab or a lecture, but in a committee, the <coughs> University Research Committee. And that committee has a job of reviewing what we now call Aspire Grants, the grants for internal support of research projects for faculty and students. Uh, and it's a very tough job because of the range of the uh, faculty's expertise and the various departments and disciplines. 
And a lot of faculty would complain about that. So we fixed the rules to make them a little better. But one of the persons who didn't complain was my student appointee, one Robert Morris. He just simply took on the task, didn't complain, did his work, asked questions when he needed to. And it just impressed the heck out of me as somebody who had temperament and a lot of personal skills. So I was with the rest of the department in that because he certainly was somebody we thought so highly of and sent him off to Illinois and then to Berkeley and then to time to come back. Coming back, uh, he wanted to come back. He wanted to come back if possible at Ball State. We had an opening, so it looked like a good thing. The only issue at, at all that came up was from a, an external reviewer who was visiting the department. Gave us a lot of positive feedback about how we were doing our, our programs but made a suggestion that it wasn't a very good idea to bring our own students back as faculty members because it was a kind of an inbreeding process. <laughs> department ignored them. <coughs> and fortunately we did. So Bob had the successful career as a, uh, as a faculty member uh, and uh, I certainly shared with him as a colleague. That was the second uh, relationship. And then ultimately he became department chair and became my boss, uh, along with the rest of us. Uh, there's a term that describes the department in those days rather well, I think, herding cats. The uh, folks had various views on things and they were willing to argue those out and so we had a lot of controversies within the department and then those all fall on the desk of the chair and so we, so it went and it was just at times difficult and times when times it was hard to resolve those kinds of issues not when Bob became chair he uh, had a way as a, as a department chair of finding common ground getting the best skills out of everybody and reaching common goals thereby. I thought he was an excellent department chair. So that he was going along that quite well. Our department was doing very well. We were building the biochemistry program for one thing and uh, some graduate programs and constant stream of good undergraduate students. <clears throat> so fast forward. It's June of 2007. <coughs> And guess what I'm doing? I'm getting ready to retire. What do you do? Clean out your desk. Fuss around with all the stuff that's accumulated in your office. But the phone rang. It was the provost. Dr. King had been here about a year and was still in some respects feeling his way. He said, uh, I'd like your advice on something. We have an opening for the acting dean of the graduate school. I need to find somebody. Do you have any suggestions? And I gave that some thought. And it kept coming back to that young student who was reading those research proposals or the way in which the department was running so well with Bob's leadership. So I became his advocate. And so, I called Dr. King, he said, call him and have him come over. And the rest is, you know, acting dean of the graduate school, the acting vice president, acting provost, and with, I think with the leadership of Terry King as president and Bob Morris as provost, the university achieved some giant goals that came, came uh, to a new level of excellence and that level has continued to grow and I credit those two chemists uh, in leadership for a lot of making that happen. So there are just a couple more things that, that uh, we had to share in common. I had one of the best offices in this, in this uh, university at the 
of sponsored programs office. There's big sky windows, beautiful lighting, wonderful uh, atmosphere to work and visit and so on. Well, guess who got that office when I left it? Just that very shortly, because the graduate school and the research office were together, uh, it, it turned out to be Bob's office, so I gave him my office. So I, I would say two things about Bob that, that impressed me and I think are key to what he was, what he was as a leader and as a person. One was he was, he was the penultimate quintessential Hoosier. And I would just cite two things about him that I think qualified him for that compliment. Number one, his love of the land, which is evident in, in, in the farmstead and, and his, his attitudes. Secondly, the ability to find people with diversity and skill and bring them together to reach a common ground. And I guess I would just say, rest in peace. Thanks again, Jim. Our, our first speaker, research speaker today is uh, Armand uh, Kasarabi. And uh, Armand has completed his undergrad work in Iran and uh, came to Ball State in uh, 2021. Uh, he is currently competing, completing his uh, MS in chemistry, conducting organic and bioorganic chemistry research with Dr. Wei Shi and myself. And, uh, uh, he's planning to complete and defend his thesis uh, and graduate this summer, and then he's going to pursue his PhD in, in organic chemistry at Purdue University, uh, turning down offers from IU, Notre Dame, Utah, and Michigan State at least. So, without any further ado, uh, take it away, Armand. Right. Thank you, Dr. Samson. So, I'm Armand, and I'm a second year master's student, and today I'm here to talk about organic chemistry due to synthesis of open ring, alpha cell, tsunami, containing and loss of osmosis, which is basically this structure. Okay. So a little bit of background. So we are interested in a promotion family, natural products. So this is uh, the complete family, A, B, C, D, F. And this is the general structure. So um, <coughs> we are specifically interested in osmosis F, which in this structure going to be uh, R1 going to be H, and R2 going to be acid also, this group going to be acid. So basically, uh -huh. this is... you want to talk louder, or microphone? Oh, microphone? Talk louder, yeah. Talk louder? Oh. So, <coughs> this natural product has a carbohydrate core, and a fatty <coughs> acid chain, and two alpha beta on side chain of the system. <coughs> All right, so a lot of the structure activity relationship has been done in this natural product, and this tsunami part um, turned out that it's really important. So when you remove that tsunami part, the natural product loses like around 1,000 fold of activity. So it's really important part of the natural product. And then also, if you remove the double bond in natural product, it shows uh, activity is Losing activity around 150 volts and so on. So it's, uh, it's a big activity loss. So this shows that some kind of interaction um, it, between protein and the alpha beta unsaturated system is happening, which we think is covalent bond between the alpha beta unsaturated system and the protein. But when the group did the uh, target ident identification using this analog, they, they couldn't prove that. And then also, when they do the cryem uh, studies, this structure shows no covalent bond between the alpha beta unsaturated or this uh, protein uh, around this part, they don't have the um, basically nucleophile side chain to um, interact with the 
of a beta unsaturated system. So basically, these show, these contradict with the structure activity relationship. That's why we want to test our idea, which is um, we think it's kind of interaction between protein and natural products still, but it's kind of, a, it's reversible or transient covalent bond. So what we want to do, we just want to introduce an electron withdrawing group right on the alpha position, cyano group, to make the beta position more positive. So if it's our theory is right, and there's transient uh, interaction between protein and natural product, it should um, uh, increase the activity of natural product because it helps to bond better with the protein. So this is the step that we introduced the regular cyanic acid. But in our senses, we're going to uh, introduce the cyanocinamic acid, which basically be improving the upper beta unsaturated system in the natural product. All right, so of course, if you want to test our idea, we have to do the total synthesis. So this is the original structural natural product. Um, as I said, a lot of structure activity relationship has been done on this. So it turned out if you leave the ring open, so the natural product is still active. Um, and the good thing about this, you don't need to do RCM, so we don't need to dilute the reaction and you can scale up. Other part could be optimized too. So this part, they used to be, uh, they used this reaction, we will load the yield reaction. But if you uh, to replace that CH2 with O, which uh, the structure uh, activity relationship have been done, if you put the O on the, the carbon 5, it's still active, so you can put it there. So you can go through this reaction to the high yield reaction. And this part is the chiral center. Um, it used to be um, this reaction tree step using this ex expensive starting material. But if you make it a chiral, you can replace it with this alcohol. So this is the molecule we targeted. This molecule is still active, 40 nanomolar uh, IC50. So IC50 is basically concentration, we just add the Kels 50% of the cancer. All right, so this is retrosynthesis of the open ring. So first we have to synthesize this uh, two really important intermediate, glucose donor and glucose acceptor. Then we have to couple these two to glycosylation reaction to get this really important intermediate. Then we have to synthesize this intermediate, which is right before the introducing cyanocinamic acid to test our idea. Then is the target molecule. All right, so I'm going to talk about, about synthesis of this. So first, glucose donor. Glucose donor. So, for glucose donor, you start, we start with the pre-acylated uh, D-glucose, and we just replace acetate group on N-meric carbon. Then we do alcoholysis to deprotect uh, <coughs> uh, position two, three, four, and six. Then we do the isopropylation or protection of position four and six with isopropylation protecting group. Then we do acidification of position two and three with lumulonic acid and EDC as a coupling reagent, easy reaction, no problem is needed. And then we did this reaction, which is the cleavage of the thio group, uh, which could be another complete presentation by itself. But what we did basically, we optimized this system. It, it matters what protecting group is on position four and six and what uh, group is on anomeric carbon. And it depends what, what base <coughs> is and what solvent the system you use. So it took us a summer to uh, optimize this one, but eventually we optimized it, and we could just do a thio group, and then we just react the hemiacetyl, the trichloroacetonitrile, to get the glucose uh, <coughs> donor, really reactive reagent. All right. so. Another important intermediate is fucose acceptor. So to synthesize that, you just start with the D, D fucose and, and do acylation using acidic and pyrite, then using benzylamine to, to get this um, uh, hemiacetyl. Then we do the uh, same reaction that we did on the last step of the 
and glucose donors. So basically, just reacting and still we try to pull acetonitrile to make the gluc um, this donor. Then we do glycosylation reaction between this alcohol and this um, uh, trichloroamidate uh, donor to get this um, uh, this intermediate and really good yield. Um, this glycosylation reaction, we didn't talk about it, it's really important <coughs> reaction in disulfide part. And then we do alcoholysis um, to deprotect the position two, three, and four. Really easy reaction. And, the, uh, and then we protect the position three with TBS protecting group, which selectively goes to position three to get this uh, fucose acceptor. So um, we got glucose donor, fucose acceptor. Now we have to couple them to get the carbohydrate core of the natural product. So to do this, we have to do glycosylation reaction. So we have some problem with this reaction. This is really strong acid, and this is acid label in iso this isopropylene protecting group. So we have to be really careful with this uh, protecting group and this acid. So because if it's uh, cleave this, and this is OH, and it's going to uh, react with this one, it's going to be a mess. So first we got like 50%, I think. Then we figured out and optimized it uh, between uh, Minus 58, minus 52, and you have to quench it at 18 minutes, other than that, it's going to decompose. So, yeah, so we optimized that, we got 86% out of the first uh, step, then we do acylation of the, this uh, acyl OH. So, overall, 82%. So, we optimized that one, and then we we did cleaved LEV groups on position two and three of uh, glucose with the hydrazine monohydrate and um, buffer solution in acetic acid and pyridine. They're really high yield, really uh, easy reaction to do. Then uh, the acidification and coupling of tiglic acid with the alcohol. So we use different coupling reagent for this reaction. It turned out if we use TCC, we can bet TCC is stronger coupling reagent, so you can get a better result with TCC. But this one was a, was a hard reaction kind of, but we got over it. <coughs> All right, so um, the next was to cleave this isopropylene protecting group using CSA, which is a, a common method people use, which you did when it's 86%, it's really high yield reaction. So next we do we do protecting our primary alcohol here and put the tritiol group here uh, to protect that primary alcohol. So now this is the important intermediate uh, that we need right before the coupling to cyanocinamic acid. So um, but we need to make cyanocinamic acid. So for making cyanocinamic acid, we search literature and we found different methods. Um, making cyanocinamic acid could be another presentation completely, but this was like the first part of my research. Um, but so one method is just uh, use ammonium acetate tolerant, just reflux it, and you can get it. But there's some problem with this uh, one, which we, I cannot go and talk about all of it, but <coughs> you can get it like this, or you can use the uh, ethanol, pyridine, <coughs> pyridine and ethanol, and condense it. But when you do the like one step, the problem with this one is when you do one step, the solubility is not there. So if you want to do column, good luck. So it's really, really hard. So, but if you do uh, two steps and do, a, you just make the ester form, and then the solubility of this is really good. You just run a column and then just do hydrolysis easily. So this is, we currently use this one to make this cyanocinamic acid, whatever it is. All right, so we made some cinnamic acid. Uh, now we have to couple it with the natural product. So when we wanted to couple this one, we had to uh, really, uh, we had, it was really challenging. But um, it's challenging because the product and the starting material, they have almost the same RF value. And it's not going to completion, and you have to move. Then you move, and you cannot 
cleave tritio with the starting tail, but you can cleave, cleave the tritio with the product. So it's kind of complicated. We kind of made it 50%. On paper, 50% is not bad, but when you look at the reaction, it's, it's pretty complicated if you move. So, um, yeah, so if it's synamic acid, regular synamic acid, no problem, you can couple it. But some synamic acid is harder to couple. Then next step we did a TSA using to cleave the tritail group. Um, so a straightforward reaction, probably more than 80, 90 something, but last time I did it. And then uh, this part, we have to couple this long chain acid and do the esterification using EDC one. So we, we talk about EDC, DC, CC, and BR, all this coupling, but it's really important to, important to, to figure out which coupling reagent when to use. So if you use DCC here, DCC is strong, but it's coupled with this one. Now it's only coupled with this one. So you have to be careful which, which coupling reagent you use. So EDC is better one, is best for this, uh, this step. And then, of course, the last step is the cleavage of TBS using the TBAF. Um, and as you can see, we got 55%, which we don't know what is the reason, to be honest. We have to test more. We did two batches of this. But we got the final product, as you can see. Um, so, and this is the NMR that I did yesterday. And HBSC shows around 92% purity. So, yeah, so this is that. And the future work will be to try different analogs of sound and dynamic passing. At the best, we do one lecton donating and one lecton withdrawing to a plural or toxic using try these to do. And of course, a uh, big question is the testing, the biological activity for the future work. And that's going to be um, a big part of the research about to see what is the changes in biological activity. So I want to thank my our research group, our my um, advisor, Dr. Shin, Dr. Samuelson, um, and our research group that I never see them in the lab, but anyway. <laughs> that's it for me. Thank you so much. Structure didn't show any covalent modification. Yes. Is it possible there's another target that's covalently modified that's not that protein? Oh no, the target molecule has been identified already, right? What did they So what no, was your question? So that's one protein, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Is it possible there are other targets in the cell that are not that protein that, that your molecule covalently modifies? I don't know. Maybe. I'm not a biologist, to be honest. But yeah, so based on the only thing I know is that based on the protein around it, they don't So that, that yeah, if you change the amino acid and then the activity of the drug will lose like a one thousand fold. So they think this is the only target for this model. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> 
I'm just curious, when you talked about uh, how the use of different coupling agents for that um, production of the hydroxyl group, the DCC versus EDC, I'm just yeah. curious, what is the reason that using DCC you go, will go after for that two prime hydroxyl group and you EDC? Said, uh, all the way back. <coughs> So like last step? Yeah, you were like <coughs> last couple slides. Here? I think so, yes. So you said what? What is your question? Uh, you, I think you mentioned that if you use DCC, DCC yeah. you will protect the two prime. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, what two. is the reason? So DCC, what we found, is not uh, selective. It's so strong, it doesn't care. It's just one couple. But EDC is like mitre. But here, position two is TBS is right beside it, so it's bulky. Usually, nothing can couple with it. When we even couple Tiglet, you cannot couple here. So it's just one spot. But if you use DCC in the last step, it can couple with this one. Uh, would you couple both the two prime position and the five, or just would you go after both of those? Uh, DCC, yeah. Okay. DCC, yeah. It kind of 50, 50, but if you use EDC, it's better. With Sion, is better. Other analogs could be another presentation, but with Sion, EDC is better. Sion is another presentation. Yeah, I'm just curious about this EDC versus EDC. Yeah. 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 And DCC, when you use all these across, DCC is always strong. Uh, no matter what reaction you do. Okay. In the grand scheme, it's not that strong in coupling agents. Right? Compared to HBTU or HATU or things like that. In the grand scheme of coupling agents, uh, at carboxylic acid, it's not that active. More active than those you talked about. Okay. But it's surprising that because DCC is way bulkier yeah. right, than EDC. I know what you're Based on my experience on this molecule, mm -hmm. I have no clue <coughs> the other ones. But on this molecule, DCC is strong. That's my conclusion. Should be like this. But the problem is I have to roll down all this stuff on graduating two months, which is impossible. No, no I mean, I, yeah, the result is what the result is. But the explanation, uh, it just doesn't work, and sometimes you don't know the answer, but it just doesn't work. There's that two positions, that those positions don't look that different to me from the serums. Uh, you mean the this two, one the two free alcohol positions? This one and this one? Mm -hmm. yeah, you mean like, uh, wait, this TBS is right beside it, right? What's that? TBS. Uh huh. So bold? Yeah. Well, that's what's weird, because DCC is bigger, and yet it's still coupled with that one. Yeah, but it's like, uh, it's, yeah, again, if you, DCC looks like it's not, doesn't care about selectivity, it just wants to couple as soon as possible. Yeah, but, but it's still going to be able to get there, right? Yeah, you're right. I don't know what that is. The power reactor is, you can't get to the space from that. Yeah. In this case, obviously, it did. So I'm just saying it's weird, it's surprising that it's going against Sarah's in these choice of these two alcohols. So I suspect something more complicated is going on there. And it's primarily reacting. It's got choice between two positions and you say it's more reactive, you expect even distribution of this. So if it's primarily reacting at that alcohol, that's unusual because that's the more sterically congested position is the more sterically congested region. All right, let's go ahead and thank our speaker again. All right, our next speaker is uh, Philip Betts. He's a senior chemistry uh, major, and he'll be graduating this spring. And is also, and he's currently doing uh, chemical research, or biochemical research, with Dr. Jordan Prose. And uh, Philip is also in the accelerated master's program for biotechnology. So after he graduates this spring, he will graduate again also next year with his master's degree. So without further ado, I'll leave it to you, Philip, for your talk.
Hi, I'm Philip Betts, and today I'd like to talk about improving the substrate scope of toluene dioxygenase through enzyme engineering. There are three things I'd like to talk about today. The first is just a background on enzyme engineering in general and why it's important, as well as our specific enzyme system, risky dioxygenase. Then there are two projects that I'd like to talk about that I've done. The engineering of the toluene dioxygenase iron coordinating complex, as well as improving toluene dioxygenase activity for benzoates through enzyme engineering. While the chemical industry is incredibly valuable, <coughs> it is also very bad for the environment. The chemical industry currently accounts for 14% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions and is projected to become the world's largest consumer of oil by the year 2030. This is largely due to the need for petroleum-based solvents and toxic heavy metal catalysts in, the, in chemical synthesis. However, enzymes can be used as a tool to help mitigate the harmful environmental impact of chemical synthesis. Enzymes are proteins that act as biological catalysts, speeding up the rates of biological reactions. As they are not designed to function in the cell, they function at physiological conditions and in aqueous solutions, which are much milder conditions than most chemical reactions. In addition, enzymes are completely biodegradable, meaning that they create fewer and more benign byproducts as a result of their use. Despite this, enzymes are still largely unused in synthesis. While there are over 4,000 enzymes currently known to science, only about 20 are produced and used on an industrial scale. The enzyme that system that our lab works with is risky dioxygenases. These are a, a family of enzymes originally found in soil bacteria that perform the cis dihydroxylation of aromatic pollutants, which they use as a food source. In doing so, these enzymes perform cyclic and antimerically pure cis dioxys. This reaction is coupled with the oxidation of NADH to NAD+, and it is performed by a three-component system of a reductase, ferredoxin, and oxygenase. Risky dioxygenases are very valuable in synthesis for two reasons. The first is that they are the only enzymes that can perform cis dihydroxylation in a single step. The second is that they are strictly regioselective and stereoselective. They always form two three diols and they always form cis diols. As a result, these cis diol metabolites can be used in the synthesis of bioactive compounds as it allows a synthetic chemist to control the stereochemistry of any products formed from a, a risky dioxygenase metabolite. However, the synthetic utility of these enzymes is limited by an inability to metabolize su substrates with very sterically large or polar substituents as the active site of the enzyme is very tight to the toluene substrate as well as very nonpolar. However, enzyme engineering has been shown to increase the substrate scope and improve the activity for many substrates of this enzyme. The enzyme engineering process is what we use to improve the activity of risky dioxygenases. You start with the parent gene, which is the native wild type form of your enzyme. Using mutagenesis, either error-prone PCR, which puts random mutations in at any point along the gene, or site-directed mutagenesis, which takes a specific residue and mutates it to other residues. That allows a library of mutants of your target enzyme to be created. Each of these mutants can be transformed into bacteria, which is, we use E. coli in our lab, and then expressed and assayed for a desired trait. At our lab, we assay for enzyme activity on specific substrates, and we find the mutants that have the highest activity for what we are looking for, and we use those mutants as the parent genes in a further route of enzyme engineering. 
In order to perform this engineering and engineer risky oxygenases to increase activity, it is necessary to have an assay to quantify this activity. We had to design this assay ourselves as previously reported methods either provided very limited information on what was actually going on in the enzyme or they required very highly specialized, very expensive equipment. Our assay, the metapyridate fluorescent cystyle assay, allows for the easy, high throughput detection of risky dioxygenase metabolites. These metabolites, after their creation by the enzyme, are oxidized to their corresponding aldehydes by sodium metapyridate, which are then conjugated with a fluorescent probe to produce an imine, which provides a strong, concentration-dependent fluorescence response. This allows the concentration of any risky dioxygenase metabolite created by our enzymes to be determined. As we've done our uh, engineering of risk adoxinases, we have always avoided mutating the metal coordinating residues of this enzyme. This is because risk adoxinases are metalloenzymes, and engineering studies on metalloenzymes generally avoid mutating metal coordinating residues. It's assumed that if you mutate a metal coordinating residue on a metalloenzyme, you're going to lose metal coordination and as a result, you're going to lose enzyme activity. However, there have been recent studies on heme-coordinating proteins that have found that alterations to heme-coordinating residues can improve the activity for your enzyme or even provide novel activity. In these cases here, turning this heme-coordinating cysteine to a serine, histidine, or tryptophan, I'm sorry, tyrosine, we are shown to disrupt where the heme is in the active site of the enzyme. However, this is still allowing for increased activity despite disruption of the heme coordination, and even changing it to alanine, which completely removes heme coordination, still allows for increased activity when you would have expected there to be a completely <coughs> inactive enzyme. <coughs> As a result, we thought that it would be a good idea to try engineering the iron coordinated complex of toluene dioxygenase. Unlike those proteins discussed earlier, toluene dioxygenase coordinates, uh, catalyzes reactions through a mononuclear iron atom. This atom is coordinated by two histidines and an aspartate. In, in my experiment, I mutated each of those three iron coordinating residues to the other residues capable of iron coordination, as well as alanine, which is known to remove iron coordination, creating a library of 12 mutants. These mutants were tested for activity along with the parent enzyme to serve as a positive control, as well as an inactivated enzyme to serve as a negative control on a library of aromatic <coughs> substrates. Both of those that the native toluene dioxygenase can metabolize, as well as those that it cannot. Here is a graph showing the activity of each of our mutants on our library of aromatic substrates. While there are some substrates that our parent enzyme has activity for and some that it does not, as you can see, each mutation to all of our iron coordinating residues resulted in a complete loss of cis dihydroxylation activity. This suggests that all iron coordinating residues in their wild type forms are necessary for enzyme activity. While these are not the results we were hoping for, as it does not provide us with any variance with increased activity, it is still valuable data as it will inform our mutation of other risky dioxygenases as we will completely avoid any iron coordinating mutations in the future. The second project that I performed was improving the activity of risky dioxygenase for benzoates. Our lab in the past has been able to improve toluene dioxygenase's activity for many aromatic substrates, and including those with very little or no activity for the wild type enzyme. And the cis metabolites of benzoates 
are incredibly useful in synthesis, as can be seen by their necessity in the production of Tamiflu. However, benzoates are incredibly polar, which leads to low risk adoptionase activity for them, for benzoate substrates. There is a method of producing benzoate cisdiols through the palladium catalyzed carbonylation of risk adoptionase metabolites, but this requires a palladium catalyst and adds an additional synthetic step, which are both very non ideal in chemical synthesis. To improve the activity of risky adoptionases for benzoates, we first took a library of risky adoptionase expression systems that is several different members of the risky adoptionase family and tested them for activity on methyl benzoate. And we found that the only system with any activity for methyl benzoate was toluene dioxygenase. So we chose to pick that as the basis for our engineering experiments. We took eight active site residues, these highlighted in yellow, and we performed saturation mutagenesis on all of them, taking each amino acid and mutating it to all of the other possible amino acids at that site. We, this allowed for eight libraries of variants to be created, which were then all tested for activity on both methyl benzoate and ethyl benzoate. In doing so, we found we created a large amount of data showing the activity for very for different variants on their activity for methyl benzoate, and we found eight point mutations that were found to improve activity for methyl benzoate or ethyl benzoate. As you see here, this is the wild type activity of the enzymes for these substrates. It has very little activity for methyl benzoate and almost zero activity for ethyl benzoate. But we found in each of these mutations, there are large, large increases in activity for one or both of these substrates. And in the future, to further increase the activity of this enzyme for these substrates, we're going to combine the eight beneficial mutations that we found and test double and triple mutations for their activity on benzoates to further increase the enzyme activity. In addition, <clears throat> while it is very easy to determine the effects that a wild, that a active site mutation would have on a activity, it is much harder to determine the effects of any other amino acids elsewhere in the protein, whether or not they matter for enzyme activity. So we're going to perform a random mutagenesis across the whole enzyme in the hopes of finding non-active site variants with activity for polar substrates such as benzoates. I'd like to thank all of the members of our lab for their help on this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. Uh, do we have time for a question or two? Yeah. Okay, so I have a question. Um, so when you do, when, when you do random mutations, how do you make sure that you're doing mutations non you know, not. Um, so the the alpha subunit of our enzyme has something like 400 450 ish amino acids and the active site has eight amino acids so okay I'm getting a little, it's okay. a, little a few more than that but you're right your your line of thinking is correct yeah. uh-huh so we're going to get active site mutations when we do this, but we're going to get so many more non-active site mutations that we're certain to find non-active site mutations. Okay. All right, that's so once you have performed the mutagenesis, how do you make sure where the change has happened? Um, so we perform our assays, 
and then we perform assays on whichever mutants we found with increased activity. And if, if the same culture has found increased activity twice, then we send it off to get sequenced. And then it's only at that point that we find what mutation was actually made to the enzyme. Yeah? Uh, so once you use your bacteria to engineer your enzymes, do you destroy them or do you use them? They're very, uh, very we, we destroy them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, great talk. It's just, just you know, philosophical uh, question linked to directed evolution. Essentially, with this method, you can create a quite potent toxin as an enzyme, right? And I was wondering if there were any what, accidents in the past, someone you know, inhaled or somehow <laughs> tried to have in the body and someone you know, ended up in the hospital. So, do you, I don't know, uh, taking care of some of the safety measures when you're working with this type of uh, recombinant protein or enzymes? Um, so, when we run our, when, when we run our assays, uh, we're, we're obviously using safety equipment. We're, we're wearing gloves and lab coats. And, we make very, very little uh, concentrations. concentrations, yes. And we're doing these reactions in a couple hundred microliters of solution. I, I've never been worried about any <laughs> safety issues. All right, let's go ahead and thank our speaker. Everybody get a cookie? Ready to go again? Yeah, you guys need a break <laughs> before I start talking. You're free to get up. Can everybody? Oh, go ahead. I was going to just introduce you yes. quickly, so go ahead. But, uh, uh, or for a second, I just wanted to uh, take a break from uh, the talks. Uh, the Morris family is here as long as other friends, and uh, uh, I think Rick Morris is going to say a few words. So let's do that now before the keynote. Not a chemist. All I know is it's fantastic. It's all I got. So my name is Rick Morris, bro brother of Bob Morris, Dr. Morris. On behalf of the Morris family, we thank you for attending today's chemistry symposium in honor of my brother Bob. I would like to thank Dr. Samuelson, Ball State Chemistry Department, the Graduate School sponsored project administration for organizing and supporting this well-organized chemistry symposium. A very special thank you to Dr. James Storwell for traveling to Ball State, I think from Oregon, to be the keynote speaker for today. Also on behalf of the Morris family, I would like to thank the Ball State Foundation for the creation and support of the endowment fund number 1503. Bob was the first person on either of my parents' sides to graduate from college let alone become a PhD chemist. 
My parents were extremely proud of him, as was I. I made my career in radiology, doing x-ray, CT scans, and diagnostic ultrasound. If you knew Bob, you knew how humble he was. He loved teaching and helping others, regardless of what he was helping them with. Bob was, would be overjoyed to be here today with all of you and everyone attending this symposium. For those of you who do not, did not know Bob, he held Ball State very near and dear to his heart. One of his nicknames was Mr. Ball State. Bob graduated from Ball State University, summa cum laude, 1986, with a bachelor's degree in chemistry. He then went on to receive a PhD in inorganic chemistry at the University of Illinois and finished with a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of California at Berkeley. Soon after, he accepted a position as professor of chemistry here at Ball State in 1991. Since then, he became a tenured professor, chair of the chemistry department, associate provost of research, and dean of graduate school which was the position he held for many years here at Ball State. In 2016, during his last few months at Ball State, he had been working in the position as the Ball State Acting Provost. He worked closely with Ball State's president at the time, Dr. Terry King. He was also involved in many other events and committees that he contributed greatly to. His reputation at Ball State was impeccable and well-respected. He devoted his entire life equally to his Ball State University chemistry and administrative career and to his family. I thank you all for attending today's symposium. And I wish that all of your chemistry endeavors are a lifelong success for you. It certainly was for Bob. And on a side note, uh, in 2017, after his death in November of 16, I organized a golf outing to honor Bob and raise money for a local charity event called Secret Families that gives Christmas gifts, Christmas trees, etc., to over 350 local, less fortunate families in Delaware County in early December. This year's annual golf outing, titled the Dr. Robert Morris Memorial Golf Outing, is scheduled for Saturday, August the 12th at Maplewood Golf Course, South of Muncie. Last year's event raised nearly $15,000 for Secret Families. I am soon to have the official flyer completed. If you are interested in playing, being a whole sponsor, making a donation, please see me today. Rob plays as well. He has my contact information. You can go for him. But, but it really means so much to the Morris family. I miss him dearly. He was so smart. I always do this. I'm a baby. He was a much better person than I was. I was good. Bob was better. And so, thank you, Dr. Storm. Thank you, Rick, uh, for those great words on Bob. And uh, yeah, Bob would have definitely been excited to see what chemistry students are doing with support from our department. And of course, he'd be really excited. Uh, keynote speaker, Dr. James Storhoff. Uh, he's an alum of Ball State. He actually carried out research with Bob Morris as an undergrad student here. And it's worth mentioning also that James is the son of Bruce Storhoff, who is a professor emeritus as well. That could not be with us today. But, uh, and then uh, uh, Bob had actually done his, some of his undergrad research when he was at Ball State with James's dad, Bruce. So uh, a fitting uh, tribute there again to Bob. So James went on to earn his PhD at Northwestern University once he graduated from Ball State. And then he's currently the Senior Director of Diagnostic Product uh, Development at uh, Verisite. And uh, we just thank you for coming, visiting, and uh, seeing our new building and being back at, in the department. So without uh, further ado, I'll go ahead and let you have your time. All of our time today, uh, we're going to also go through a lab notebook here. It's got uh, James's name on it. Wow. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. 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 The research you did back in Cooper. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, and it's um, just it's been a marvelous day being back here at Ball State. I can't tell you uh, how great it's been uh, looking out and seeing some faces of the professors who. Uh, taught me uh, 
really foundationally what I needed to know to have a you know pretty successful career in science so far and I, it all started here um, so I have a lot of people to thank uh, Bob and beyond so um, just getting started again just a background on myself sort of my journey um, again it started here um, I graduated in 1995 and I did research in Bob's lab for about two years, two to three years. He's the one that got me in there, and I'll talk more about Bob at the end of my talk. Um, you know, I was working on titanium and dental complexes in Bob's lab, um, and went on to Northwestern, where I got my PhD. I was in um, Chad Merkin's laboratory, and I'm gonna talk about this part, along with um, the work I did at Nanosphere, and this was a company founded by um, Merkin and Bob Lutzinger, a biochemist. Um, where some of this research went on, um, we commercialized it. And from there, I was at uh, Nanosphere for about 10 years. It's, it's still there, it was bought by another company called Luminex. Um, and there's at least one Ball State alum uh, still at Nanosphere that I know of. He was in the genetics group, um, or genetics department here, and he's in a senior uh, manager in manufacturing now, Jonathan Holbrook, um, is still there to my knowledge. Um, and I moved on to a company, Nanostring, um, that was doing gene expression research. I'm not going to get to this. This was the cancer part. Um, we worked on assays for oncology. Um, you can look up Prosigna if you're interested. It's out there. It's FDA cleared. Um, it's used for uh, breast cancer prognosis. And really, I've just it's been a continuation at Verisite, um, Nanostring. Um, decided they didn't want to work in diagnostics anymore. Verisite bought that part of the business, and so I've continued working on, on these types of assays on this, on this gene expression analysis system at um, Verisite. But for my talk, I'm going to focus here. And is there any help to get that pointer? I think there was a laser pointer. But if not, I'll just go. But to get started, I know you guys don't want to hear me drone on for 30 minutes, so first there's a trivia question. This is my COVID test when I was feeling sick in June, and I was like, okay, it's finally hit, finally I got COVID, and this is my control line, this is my sample line, right? It's a positive test. And my question to you is, do any of you know what the material is that causes this pink line to, to light up? Any guesses as to what material that is? Pink color, obviously. Nano-sized. Nano Precious, it's a metal. Gold. Gold, he's got it. Yes, it's gold. Gold nanoparticles covered with antibodies that are used to detect those antigens. So, um, pretty ubiquitous, right? We've all taken these tests, and uh, that, that material is gold. And kind of surprising, right? I think most people would guess that it's some sort of metal that results in a pink line, but I'm going to talk about that. And so, yeah, I'm first going to talk about the research at Northwestern again. Uh, PI yeah, here, uh, Chad Merkin and uh, Bob Letzinger, who is an emeritus professor at Northwestern when I was there. Um, a biochemist really specialized in nucleic acids research, and um, Merkin's research focused on gold thin films, um, gold nanoparticles, and um, starting off this research was really one of my fellow graduate students, Bobby Music, uh, Mucic, and um, a, a postdoc in Lutzinger's lab who was, you know, conducting some of the DNA research, Robert Alleghanian and myself. Um, but really, we focused on. Um, I'll get into it on the next slide. Um, combining DNA with these gold nanoparticles, that was really our, our research focus. And I focused on characterizing the properties of some of these DNA gold conjugates. So just to get started, um, how do you make gold nanoparticles? And this is, you know, dates back to the literature, 1973. Um, you have hydrogen tetrachlororate here. So gold's positive, you can add citrate as a reducing agent in water, add heat, and uh, voila, you get these 13 nanometer gold particles covered in citrate. And this is a, a TEM image of these particles. 
Um, you can see they're about 15, 13 to 15 nanometers in diameter. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so this TEM image here, these particles are about 15 nanometer in diameter. And you can see you have this whopping extinction coefficient um, at 520 nanometers. So the electrons are confined to the surface of the particles that uh, results in them oscillating at a specific frequency that's in the visible range. And this is, um, the size of these particles is very tunable. That's all been worked out. If you read the literature, uh, Mike Maton at Penn State, you know, was able to make particles of many different sizes. Um, you can also make particles from silver, other metals as well. Um, we like these 15 nanometer particles because they turned out to be very stable. And when you get into <coughs> diagnostics and other applications, stability is very important. Um, as, you, as these particles grow and get larger in size, you can stabilize them, but they don't necessarily stay stable for very long. And so again, we were focused on attaching DNA to these gold nanoparticles. And so we really took a, a page out of the self-assembled monolayer book. Um, when you make a gold thin film, um, you know, you can attach alkane thiols and those bind, the thiol gold bond is very strong. So you can form a self-assembled monolayer on uh, gold thin films using thiols. And so what we did is, is put a file here on the end of an oligonucleotide or short piece of DNA. These are about 20 bases in length. Um, and when you do that and you add them to the gold of, for about 20 hours, you form, uh, you know, these files bind and you form uh, a layer on, on the gold surface. It turns out that there are also weaker interactions between the DNA in the gold, not just the thiol. All of these bases, and we went on to study this, right, have functional groups, amines, carboxylic acids. Those can more weakly bind to the gold. So you get a poor functionalization. If you add salt, we learned this over time, that if you add salt, then you can get higher density, density on, on the gold. So we could get up to about 100 strands per particle, and then we could isolate these out and um, work with them. And so we looked at um, essentially then taking these DNA modified particles and we could have sequences A and B and then have a target DNA sequence that's A prime, B prime that could link these particles together. So we wanted to study that some. And what we would observe um, here when we link these particles together is a color change. And so you could see that here optically. These are cuvettes showing uh, the A state here where you have these uh, gold DNA modified gold particles before you add the target. And then once you get target binding, you start to see a shift in the UV visible spectrum here going from uh, pink uh, to sort of uh, bluish here in color, and here we get spotted onto a reverse phase plate. So this was like a color metric test for these DNA sequences. Um, and we went on to study these further to try to understand, again, the loading, uh, DNA loading onto these gold nanoparticles. And um, this is out, I, I actually took a snapshot out of my thesis book here because Langmuir was going to charge me $40 for the article. <laughs> and I had a word perfect document and no software to read it. So I'm like, okay, I'll take a picture of it. But um, we, we went on to look at the stability of the particles, DNA gold particles, based on a function of the oligonucleotide sequence and length. And so here we're looking at um, basically thiol oligonucleotides that are either all poly A that have 5, 10, 15, or 20 bases, um, poly T, actually this is the poly T going up, poly A down here, and poly C down here. Um, and we can't make poly G, it just folds and does funky stuff. But uh, essentially what we're seeing here is we're looking at uh, agglomeration, the critical ionic strength for when the particles would agglomerate. And what you see is that the 
the T modified oligonucleotides are much more stable. That's essentially what this graph is showing. And as you increase the length of the oligonucleotide, you get greater stability. And our hypothesis behind that was just that um, it's attributed to the weaker interaction of the DT deoxynucleoside. And we were able to show this by binding these directly, not in an oligonucleotide, but just taking the base itself. The DT had a weaker affinity for the gold surface than AC, G, or T. So um, with that understanding, um, we did additional research. And this was done by actually some other graduate students, not me. Um, uh, Lynette Demers and, and some others in the group uh, were able to develop assays to look at the surface strand coverage of these DNA molecules on these gold nanoparticles um, and also use spacers so that we could control how many hybridization events were on the surface. So this is strand coverage um, and on, on the y-axis here we have the number of hybridized oligonucleotides and picomoles per centimeter squared. But we could tune this by adding in these uh, spacer elements. And going back to T versus A, you can see here if we take A20 uh, 12mers versus T20 12mers and we measure the surface coverage on the surface. And this was a fluorescence assay. So we, we can essentially put a fluorescent tag on the end knock these off the surface of the gold particle, then measure the fluorescence and count how much is there. Um, you can see here that we got a higher density or more strands per particle for the T2012 MERS than the, than the A2012 MERS. And so we really were, were able to get to the point where we could control this quite uh, readily. And then in uh, around that same time, 2000, right when I was uh, finishing up a postdoc in Chad's lab by the name of Andrew Tayton, um, started to do research on uh, using these gold nanoparticle probes in conjunction with DNA arrays, okay? And so what this allows you to do is to be able to detect multiple DNA targets simultaneously. And that's important for um, Infectious diseases, you know, if you want to look at multiple uh, DNA sequences simultaneously from different organisms, you're going to take an approach of an array. Um, it could also be, it's been used, you know, gene expression analysis, so forth, has been used in cancer research as well. So very important to be able to do what they call um, multiplexing. And the basic uh, premise here is as follows, you spot DNA oligonucleotides for specific targets onto a glass slide, okay? So this is like you almost, you know, they have contact printers, there's also inkjet printers where you're spinning, you know, uh, micron-sized dots onto a glass slide, and those are gonna, those DNA molecules are usually mean functionalized and they covalently bind to the surface of the glass slide. Here we have, you know, four different targets that you could detect, but you could do many more than that on these glass slides, hundreds, even uh, thousands in some arrays, but we were really in the 10 to 100 range. And so the general principle here is you have this DNA functionalized array, you introduce a target of interest, here we have A prime, H prime, it's gonna bind here at A, we introduce our DNA modified gold probe H, it binds, and in this case, we do a catalytic reduction of silver onto the um, surface of the gold particle. And now you can visualize that DNA target that's present on the slide. And they can detect down to about three times 10 to the seventh copies of the DNA target here uh, in this initial uh, study that was done. And so from there, um, again, I graduated and went on to uh, Nanosphere, uh, which was formed in 2000 to develop this technology, um, nanoparticle technology for diagnostic use. The founders here were Chad Merkin and Bob Lutzinger, so my uh, graduate school PI and uh, uh, collaborator. And, um, we got venture capital funding, which was amazing, and so we were able to hire a leadership team that had 
already some experience in, in industry. You have to have that, <laughs> you know, if you're going to actually take uh, um, an idea from, from an academic setting and try to commercialize it. You really need to have individuals that uh, understand, you know, the private industry and, and how to develop these technologies because it takes a, a lot of uh, product development as well as engineering to take a product like this and get it to market. And in our case, you know, we were starting in 2000, we got a product on the market, I think 2008, something like that. So it's a long, it's a long process. There's a lot of technological hurdles, a lot of engineering hurdles, um, regulatory hurdles, right? These, anytime you're developing diagnostic products that's regulated, you're in a regulated market. So it's gotta go through the FDA. Um, so, and, and in, in industry, I'll just point out, I mean, I'm talking about some of the key leadership here, but you know, by the time 2008 rolled around, uh, we had over 100 people at this company, right? And um, many different groups. And many different groups also means many different opportunities for scientists. Uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to point this out. Um, I started out in the applied research group, also worked some in the product development group, which does assay engineering and software, software work. But ultimately you need other functions, manufacturing. You can imagine you're going from a small scale to a large scale of, of making these things, whether it's the DNA modified gold nanoparticles, um, the spotted arrays, the and then we started out using commercial silver amplification solutions, but those weren't that good. <laughs> so, you know, it was a make or buy decision, and we ended up bringing a new house to make it. So those things had to be made. Um, and so there was a lot of research there, but also ultimately it ends up in a manufacturing environment. A lot of scientists in manufacturing, right, and QC. Um, also clinical operations to run clinical studies. A lot of these people start off in a science background, same with regulatory and quality. You gotta have a science background to do these things. And some people really gravitate towards these other fields, not just research, because it's what they find that they enjoy doing. So lots of opportunities out there for sure um, in industry um, and in biotech and diagnostics to do this type of research. Um, again, so the fundamental concept here, taking this nanoparticle probe technology from the Merck Merk and Lutzinger labs, and we worked on assays for genetic and infectious disease detection, which I'll, I'll talk about on these spotted arrays. Um, and that involves some engineering uh, from our engineers to design these systems. Um, and so just, you know, there were a number of technological questions we needed to answer. Um, one is how do we get to the best sensitivity? Um, of detecting these DNA targets. So really, some of that boiled down to what's the most sensitive way to detect these silver amplified uh, gold particles. We need to detect small amounts of nucleic acid. We also need this reader to be relatively simple and low cost. It can't be ridiculously expensive um, for people to buy. Um, specificity, how do we get specific analyte signal and avoid background? Stability. All the reagents are housed in a cartridge, which I'll show. Those have to be stable. You can imagine we're gonna send these reagents to Japan or Europe. Our manufacturing group has to be able to store them either in a refrigerator or freezer. They gotta be stable when you ship them. Once they get to the customer sites, they gotta be stable when they get there, you know, at least a couple months. So um, all, of the, all of these things had to be worked out for us to be able to commercialize a product along with you know demonstrating um, that it functioned as in, intended and then also making it simple for the end user um, to minimize the number of errors this, these are clinical tests right we can't be reporting the wrong results to, to patients um, so this is a lot of where the engineering group comes in and trying to take the steps that we have may have developed in an assay format or chemistry lab and automating it All right, so just going to that first question of, you know, how do we sensitively detect these particles? Um, we published a paper in 2004, um, you know, where we developed an optical detection system to that 
optimally uh, could detect these silver amplified gold nanoparticles. And it's based on uh, basically evanescent wave induced light scatter um, in, in the plane of the glass slide. So I'll talk about that. And compared to conventional fluorescence, this was much more sensitive, about a thousand fold increase in sensitivity compared to fluorescence, which is kind of the gold standard for doing this type of work. And so um, this is showing gold particles that we've just stamped onto the gold slide. Because the question we're trying to answer here is just how, uh, how sensitive can we go? And so we've serially diluted gold nanoparticles onto the surface and silver amplified them. And in this case, we were using a commercial scanner. And you can see here that as we dilute the gold particles, the signal drops. But we can actually see all the way down to about a couple hundred particles per spot. So if you look here, these are really individual silver amplified gold particles. So hypothetically, we could detect, you know, just a couple hundred targets on the surface. That's very sensitive. So this was a good way to go um, using light scatter. And our engineers developed sort of a prototype system built by our engineering team to look at light scatter. This is an image, you know, post silver amplified with this. And this is a lower resolution imager. Um, and the, the basis of it here, as I said, is we pump light into the plane of the glass slide. That creates an evanescent wave at the surface. And when the silver amplified particles are present, they scatter light. And we have a photo sensor up here that detects it. And so again, the same, you know, dilution of particles. You can see here we can get down to about 400 particles uh, per spot with this imager. So that's what we went with. Um, now comes the assay development part, right? We got we to gotta make this work as uh, sensitively and specifically as we can. I have a question for the audience to keep you guys engaged. <laughs> it's 10 till 5. What can go wrong here, right? We're going to bind DNA to the surface. We need it to be specific. We're going to bind the gold particles to the DNA. And then we're going to take silver and a reducing agent to um, catalytically amplify onto the gold. We need to enlarge the particles. That enables you to detect them. Can you guys think of anything that can go wrong here? It could, could have come unstuck. It could. It could come unstuck, but I think the opposite problem is a bigger problem in that this could actually bind somewhere it's not supposed to. And if this binds, if the gold binds somewhere it's not supposed to, right, that's going to be background and it's going to be a problematic. Um, let me advance the slide. There's another problem too. The other problem here that potentially crops up is with silver and the reducing agent. Now, the reaction onto the gold particle surface of this catalytic reduction of silver onto gold is fast, but the competing reaction is much like you're forming a gold particle to begin with, right? The silver and the reducing agent react. They create just silver particles that are on the surface, and that creates background. <coughs> And this was actually a very big uh, challenge. The commercial silver developers were not that good. <laughs> this actually slowed down the product launch. We had to figure this out. Um, I was thinking back, you know, I'm like, what would have Bob told me to do in this circumstance? And the, and the funny thing was we did a lot of research internally ourselves. And finally, um, one of the really bright chemists on, on the nanosphere staff, this guy, Mitch Poss, said, well, I'm just going to go to the literature and see what's out there. <laughs> and, you know, I think Bob would have said, hey, man, go, go to the literature, see what you find. And, and there was a surprising find in there. The answer was, was really there for us and how to get to the stability of this. I can't really obviously speak to the formulation. <laughs> it's proprietary, but the answer was in the literature. Um, and we could develop really simple assays to look at this autonucleation. If autonucleation happens, the solution becomes turbid. So you go from sort of a clear yellow solution to a turbid solution. And so we could set up, you know, 
different conditions, different amounts of silver ion, different amounts of reducing agents, different reducing agents, and different other parameters that we vary from the literature to find kind of the optimal one that would lead to this, but not this. And so that was a big chemistry project that we had to solve, um, and we were able to ultimately solve it. Um, getting these not to bind, really when it comes to specific hybridization, it's about optimizing salt conditions, the hybridization conditions, um, and detergents and so forth so that the gold doesn't stick to the surface. So we went on um, to look at specific targets um, in human genomic DNA. So this is human genomic DNA that's been isolated from blood, and then it's been fragmented, and we hybridize it to these arrays, go through our gold particle process, and look at the results. And in this case, we're looking at SNPs, or single mutations, single point mutations in the DNA. And this is for uh, a spot of, you know, here we're looking at three different genes, the MTHFR, factor two, and factor five genes. These are single nucleotide polymorphisms that are associated with hypercoagulation disorders. So, um, uh, you know, these are germline mutations that can appear in blood and lead to these hypercoagulation disorders. And you can see here we have a patient that is what they call heterozygous. So we have wild type, uh, the wild type sequence and the mutant sequence for each of these genes spotted onto this array. Um, three replicate spots for each gene, wild type and mutant. And you can see here we have a patient that's heterozygous for the MTHFR gene, they're homozygous mutant for the factor two gene, and they're homozygous wild type for the factor five gene. And that's shown here. But we went on to show that we have, uh, you know, very, with this approach of using silver amplified gold particles, we can detect the single nucleotide polymorphisms directly on these arrays using uh, gold particles. So this assay, ultimately, you know, we, we finalized this on the system and it got cleared by the FDA and out there being used. Here's the system that our engineering team developed. We have this cartridge shown here, and this is the glass slide with the spotted array sits here. And on top of that, we have this cartridge here that houses all the reagents. I'll get into that on the next slide. But the, you have a port here where you can put, put the genomic DNA into the Fluidix cartridge. And this is a disposable, single-use, uh, self-contained cartridge. And I'll, again, I'll talk about the reagents on the next slide. This, um, once you pipette the reaction, it goes into this processor that can uh, deliver all of the different reagents required. And um, also it contains a waste res reservoir, so it can push fluids around on this cartridge, remove them, so it can introduce the DNA, followed by the gold, et cetera. And then the uh, silver amplification reagents. This is what we call the Veragene processor. So it performs the entire assay, and there's four modules here, so you can do up to four patients at a time. And then we have this uh, scanner, the Veragene ID. That is the control station and user interface, and it's used for image analysis. So it's where it does the detection of the light scatter. Here's sort of a close-up of this cartridge, and this one was for hypercoagulation. Um, again, nine reagent reservoirs are shown here, so, oops, go back. This is housing all the gold particles, the silver amplification solutions, any buffers we need for the assay. There's a waste reservoir um, and a pressure vent. And everything's barcoded. You have to be able to track it since, again, it's for and so just a final essay here, um, we also, and this became sort of the, I think really flagship product. This was a de novo application to the FDA for rapid bacterial and antibiotic resistant identification from blood cultures and cultures. So if you have an infectious organism um, 
and it, it gets into the blood. Uh, you know, the traditional tests take about 24 to 48 hours to identify the bacterial strain and determine resistance. That's through traditional microbiology techniques of culturing the organism. Um, with the processor that we developed, uh, and we put the DNA extraction on board and then apply to array, it can be done in about two and a half hours. And so we have an array here looking at the MECA gene, which can, that will tell you whether it's methicillin resistant or not, the organism. And then you also have gene specific targets that are species specific. So each of uh, these different staph species, Staph aureus from MRSA, Staph epidermis and so forth, there's genetic variations that are specific to the species. Um, we can look that up and design capture probes, essentially, that are species specific um, and go with this gold probe technology. And the key here is doing it fast. Um, what clinicians want is a fast uh, turnaround time, faster than what they can do with a culture. And so here we have um, five different samples that we were looking at, five different cultured samples. Um, we have a Staph aureus here that's shown here. Um, we have a Staph methicillin resistant Staph, Staph epidermis, which is shown here. So you see the MECA gene light up. You see Staph epidermis light up. Here for Staph aureus, you see Staph aureus light up. We have Staph Staph uh, <coughs> Phytocus here, um, and you see that light up. And then the last one here is, is MRSA. And so you see MECA and Staph aureus light up. So again, we've got specificity and sensitivity to detect um, these uh, infectious diseases from directly from culture using this nucleic acid technology. And I'm fast forwarding to real world use. <laughs> you know, so this is out in the field. Um, this is one of the customers was Children's Hospital of Los Angeles and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. It looks like this one's Children's Hospital of Philadelphia um, and the Children's Medical Center in Dallas. Um, they use this uh, system to rapidly detect these gram positive organisms uh, in pedi pediatric bacteremia cases, so in the case where there's pediatric blood infections, they use uh, this system to detect them and to speciate. Um, and so again, in their pediatric cohort, they were able to detect methicillin-sensitive Staph aureus from positive blood cultures with a sensitivity of about 99%, a specificity of 100%, and that allowed them to de-escalate uh, therapy from uh, vancomycin to uh, other agents uh, as recommended by the guidelines. They were also able to detect enterococcus uh, infections and vancomycin resistant enterococcus infections. So that's an example of how this um, technology has been used in the real world. And uh, this is the team, you know, here's a picture, at least at one point. This was a snapshot of the team, I should say, in probably about 2007. So that gives you a sense of, you know, how many people are involved in developing these types of products in the industry. It's very much a team-based approach, and uh, it literally does, you know, take a village <laughs> to develop these types of bio uh, diagnostic products in the, in the biotech industry. And um, this is a picture of our first clinical shipment, I think in about 2007. So everybody got to sign the box, <laughs> or many of us got to sign the box as it was um, going out the door. And so all, all in here, um, you know, just what Bob did for me uh, as a mentor um, you know, as was mentioned before, I did undergraduate research in his laboratory. Um, he, he was the first one that got me excited about research and, and got me into the lab. I think he had many superpowers and great qualities, but one of them was that he, he had this um, aura and sort of 
positive can-do attitude that I'll just never forget. You know, he uh, he was one of a kind in in really um, getting getting me excited about doing research. Um, he also taught me how to think through an experiment from conception, you know, running it, analyzing it, and reporting it. I did my first two posters were with Bob, um, and uh, you know that's um, really was foundational to me uh, getting getting started. And as a mentor, he was there for me every step of the way. You know, um, that included my time in graduate school. So after I left Ball State. That included my time at Nanosphere. He came by Nanosphere to talk to me. And uh, as recently as 2015, um, I was having some, some challenges and uh, Bob sat down with me for lunch. And can't, can't thank him enough uh, for everything he did for me. Uh, so that, that is really, um, he's, he was really one of a kind. Um, he'd take his shirt off his back uh, for those, you know, that that uh, that needed help. And um, I think just one more thing. I think it's really a call to action. You know, it got me thinking on the plane ride here. You know what he did for me, and maybe a call to action for us in the room is, you know, maybe this weekend you think about, you know, who has really helped you in in your life and think about the ways that they've helped you and whether you could extend that to uh, someone else who may need your help. I think it's a real call to action in the way he led his life um, and had such a positive impact on so many people. Um, it's, it's really something to aspire to. So that's my call to action to all of you um, when you walk out of the room. So thank you. Hey, I got one question. Were yeah. you involved with the company that come up with the COVID test? No, no, no. I wasn't. I no. wasn't. Um, Verisite works on diagnostics, but it's more in the cancer space. So we didn't do uh, any of the any of the COVID research. But good question. I mean, well, you started was, with that. I thought it might be a little <laughs> clue. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, um, yeah. That was really fast. I think it was an amazing really tribute to the biotech industry and frankly those tests maybe could have been faster you know if the CDC hadn't uh, decided that they wanted to do it all themselves they could have been out there faster um, but you know that's maybe a lessons learned for next time <laughs> so uh, I was curious about your uh, work with the the gram saying uh, the identification of bacteria yeah um, so you make a blood culture, so I used to do that when I worked in the hospital a long time ago. And then you don't have to incubate it at all? Is that what you're telling me? Uh, no, I don't yet. <laughs> this is uh, much faster than that was. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty amazing one to two hours, essentially, time frame to detect them um, from, from blood culture. Uh -huh. I think there's a need to do it without the blood culture. I mean, the blood culture itself takes, I don't know, it probably depends on how much organism is there to begin That's with, right. like eight to 16 hours. So you have to still do the blood culture first, but then usually to get the, the you know, to the species level and whether it's antibiotic resistance, like you said, they gotta do more plating and stuff to figure that out. Yeah. That's the part that still takes more time. But if you could skip the blood culture part, yeah. that would be even better. And I think they're working on that, I, I don't know. You know, I moved on, so right. maybe they're even there at this point. I don't know if they've gotten to that point where they can skip the blood culture, but PCR is pretty, you know, pretty sensitive. Right. And so what is your function now getting in the, in the company? Are you in research development or still or in more management? Yeah, I'm in management for sure, yeah. But I'm managing a group of product development scientists, yeah. That's my role at Verisite. And I, I'd say I was in the lab at the beginning of you know, Nanostring, but then moved out of the lab and was more managing a team of scientists in the lab developing some of these uh, types of products, types of assays. 
even in nanostring and baricite, it's still assays. They're just assays for cancer instead of assays for infectious disease. Yeah. And different technologies, yeah. Hey. Yes, uh, for your um, very gene and the data as test. So the country uh, test and all the power does not involve like any washing steps or an aspect of binding or there's no washing or just there is washing, yeah. I didn't go through the step-by-step -step process, but um, the DNA is bound to the surface, you know, and that's going to be in a hybridization, what we call a hybridization buffer that has salt and detergents, um, and it's done at a specific temperature, right, to present to prevent non-specific binding, um, and then we'll wash, go through uh, a, a salt wash of some sort. Um, after after that step and after the DNA particles are bound, yeah. And after the silver step, because the silver step you have to stop it. So the silver reagents get introduced so they can catalytically bind to the gold particle, and then you've got a stop solution that goes through there. Uh, in that method that you were asking us if there are potential problems with one specific silver binding. Was ambient light ever a problem in that? If, if it were done on the bench instead of cartridge? Mm, that's a good question. I, I think we protected the reagents from light for sure. You know, even when they're shipped from like when we're using the commercial ones that are shipped in dark bottles. Um, since they were in the cartridge and in the processor, I think they were protected from light. So, but I, I think you're right that they have to be somewhat photosensitive. And also these, these images of the slides with glowing circles, that's that effect where you send the light along the slide and it scatters and goes Yes, right that's right. With that, do the particles need to be metal or any beads will do this with an astronaut? Great question. I think it, the answer is it doesn't have to be a metal. You know, probably, Definitely size, size matters. So that's why we can't just, you know, have the 15 nanometer particle there, right? We got to grow the silver shell so that there's a big enough particle there that it scatters enough light that we can see it, right? If we just have the 15 nanometer there and you can't see much, you can definitely see 60 and 80 nanometer particles. Maybe not as well as the silver amplified, but you can de they definitely scatter enough light that you can see them. Um, but this character, yeah, and it, it could be it could be other particles. Yeah. It doesn't have to, it definitely does not have to be gold. Yeah, I think we went with it because of the you know it was developed at, at Northwestern. They licensed in all that technology, and we kind of perfected it. But I think other types of particles could be used for scatter for sure. But all great metals. question. What's that? But all metals don't they have to have a electrons moving around? Yeah. I mean, you can't use a plastic bead. Yeah, I don't know how well plastic bead. Yeah, 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 I hear you, yeah, I hear you. you have to get the silver to, to like, get the reactivity to hybridize things, but not necessarily to detect anything. Yeah. Because of which part you're talking about. I think I'm not about the word evanescent way. That's good. <laughs> yeah. I think other non metal particles will scatter light. But I think it's, you know, again, I go back to even with the DNA approach. I mean, I didn't talk about a lot of this, but, you know, we tried larger particles and things like that. I, I think the real challenge was more the stability, not that they wouldn't scatter light. Like, you can imagine other schemes, like we have this gold particle binding on, and you catalytically amplify with silver. We also tried layering particles, you know? So come in with a 50 nanometer particle and then come in with another 50 nanometer particle. Just build layers and see how much that scatters. And that works, you know? That also can get you where you want to go from a, from a detection standpoint. But from a stability standpoint, it's, um, it's more challenging. We found it more challenging um, than using the 15 nanometer particles. So, but it was a balance. I mean, there were technological challenges everywhere. As I mentioned, we had problems 
you know, we had challenges with the silver solution for a long time. We didn't solve that for a long time. So that was a real, um, real technological challenge for us to get that stable. So that's why we were trying these other approaches. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I was going to spend a long time reading a bunch of stuff for your reactions here. Oh my God. Basically, to inspire undergrad researchers, maybe you don't know exactly what you're doing yet, but you could turn out to be an awesome scientist coming in. So, we'll leave that. I want to just thank all the speakers again, and then thank everybody for afternoon on Rebob.